Hey everybody, good evening and welcome. I'm super excited. Uh, I think this is officially our first live and Q our live Q&A uh, for pet owners in 2018. So I'm super excited. Um, we're going to jump in pretty quickly because we got a ton of questions, which I'm not surprised because unfortunately lymphoma is one of the most common cancers that we see in dogs. And so a lot of you are unfortunately probably being affected with it. And I got a lot of great questions. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us. I'm super excited um, for everyone to be here. Um, so let's get going. So I'm just making sure I got everything set up um, before I do that. So I have all of my devices around me because I want to have all my questions. So that is on my iPad. Um, and then I just wanted to let everybody know that we are next live Q&A. Hey, Paula. Hey, Ellen. Everybody, thanks for joining. Hi, Kyle. Um, Dr. Stevenson up from Watertown, uh, pretty far north in New York. So our next live um, Q&A for cat lymphoma will be on Thursday, February 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern, which looks like will be the day after my beloved Matilda has her second TPLO surgery, which is scheduled for Valentine's Day. So uh, we'll have her here with me resting, cage rest, very strict. Okay, so guys, um, lots of questions. I think we got over 15 questions. Luckily, some of the questions overlap, so hopefully we will get to all of them. If not, we might just have to do a part two. So again, thank you everybody for sending in the questions. I'm really excited. Um, I will try to keep glancing over at the comments, so hopefully I can answer your questions also as we go, but I really want to um, get the questions um, that were sent in ahead of time, and I really appreciate everybody doing that because hopefully this will help everybody. Okay. Um, hey, David, thanks for joining um, from McCracken um, or Dr. McCracken from County Lane Animal Hospital. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so first question. This comes from Sue Haddon Vanderoff. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. And her question is, my dog is only seven years old, has stage two or three lymphoma. So usually stage three lymphoma means in multiple lymph nodes. So usually the ones under the jaw, that's often the one that pet owners will find. By the, in front of the shoulders and behind the knees. So that's a stage three lymphoma. And most of the dogs um, that we uh, find lymphoma are usually at least stage three. Stage four would be in the liver and spleen. Usually we determine that with an ultrasound at diagnosis. And stage five is if we see circulating lymphoma cells uh, in the blood work, uh, if a bone marrow is done and you see the cells there, or actually anything that is outside of the lymphatic system. So Gastrointestinal uh, lymphoma is automatically a stage five in dogs. Um, if there's eye involvement, just uh, like one of the cases that I had been treating, Willa, um, that would be a stage five as well. So Sue's question is, they're recommending the Madison, Wisconsin multi-agent chemotherapy protocol, which I agree that's one of the best protocols we have. Um, she wasn't sure what it was called. And her concern is that her dog um, has notoriously had a, semi, uh, a sensitive stomach and she's worried if her dog can handle chemo. Um, the, her uh, veterinarian or her oncologist says many dogs don't experience side effects, which is great. So 80% of dogs don't experience side effects, um, which is great um, and very different than, you know, lymphoma in people where in people, you know, they will get much sicker um, often and hospitalization rates in people are much higher. So in dogs, less than 5% will get hospitalized, which is great. Um, and about 80% won't have any side effects. And then about 15 to 20% will have mild to moderate side effects. Um, so Sue's really concerned that her dog, who has a sensitive stomach, would that make him more likely to have chemotherapy-related side effects? And that's a really great question, right? Because the three main side effects that we worry about in dogs is um, we worry about hair loss because of people, um, but luckily most dogs do not lose their hair coat. It's an aesthetic thing. It's not going to affect their quality of life. There are a few breeds um, that it can affect, so that would be poodles. I've made some poodles look pretty pathetic. Any dog with a continuously growing coat. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for hopping on. Um, so poodles, uh, Westies. I've made some Westies look pretty pathetic. The good news is their hair coat will grow back. 
The other two side effects that we worry about because it could affect a dog's quality of life going through chemo is gastrointestinal side effects. So vomiting, diarrhea, and loss of appetite. So Sue, it actually makes a lot of sense that you would be worried about your dog having GI side effects or more GI side effects if they have a sensitive stomach. And I have to tell you that in general, I have not, I haven't seen a study, but I personally, in my many years of experience, have not seen a correlation with a dog uh, owner who says this dog has a history of a sensitive stomach and then having more gastrointestinal side effects. So we don't see more diarrhea. We don't see more vomiting and I don't see more loss of appetite. So that's great. Also, I would encourage you to talk to your veterinarian or your oncologist about being very proactive with what I call the just in case medication. So I think when you go home, uh, hey Angel, thanks for joining on all the questions. When you go home with your first dose of chemotherapy after your dog gets his first, his or her first treatment, you should go home with a nausea medication like Serenia. You should go home with a diarrhea medication. I like metronidazole. And I am now getting all of my uh, canine patients that are going through chemo on a probiotic preventatively. So again, we wanna be proactive and not reactive. Um, we don't wanna wait for them to have those side effects. So Sue, I would um, not be discouraged by the fact that your dog has a sensitive stomach and I would still give uh, him my blessing to go on the Madison, Wisconsin protocol and we'll talk about why that's the best protocol. Um, she said he's otherwise healthy and very happy. And that's, you know, really one of the most shocking and surprising things, right, about a dog or cat with, lymph with lymphoma or cancer is they're often pretty healthy. In dogs with lymphoma, a little less than half will be symptomatic, uh, sick from their cancer at the time of diagnosis. And the hard part is it's usually nothing very specific. So they're tired, maybe they're not eating, maybe they're vomiting, um, but usually they're just feeling unwell. Um, but again, most of our dogs are pretty happy and healthy, which makes the diagnosis of lymphoma so shocking, right? I know, it really, really is. Um, so they just started prednisone, and even on the first dose of that, they needed to add an anti-nausea drug. So, Sue, we're going to talk about this coming up. In general, we don't want to start steroids before chemotherapy by more than a couple of days because it can actually make chemotherapy um, less effective. But again, a dog with a sensitive stomach should still be able to go on chemotherapy. And I personally have not seen those dogs have more side effects than a dog that does not have a history of a sensitive stomach. All right. Thank you, Sue, for your question. All right. So I'm going to try, I was trying to go through these questions and uh, do things in order, but I think um, I'm going to try to go through some of the questions about the different uh, protocols. So Angel, um, who I just saw, hey Angel, thanks for joining. Uh, so Angel is an oncology nurse. Angel, I uh, didn't uh, see where you're from. So if you're, I see that you're still here, you can tell me uh, where you're from. And she uh, gave a couple of questions, which were some pet owners, I'm assuming some of their clients. Um, oh, we even have someone from Australia. Awesome. Welcome, Kylie. Um, and a 24-year-old cat. So we're going to stick with dogs and lymphoma, um, but that could be a question that you can throw onto the Facebook page. But since we have so many questions about canine lymphoma, I'm going to stick with that. All right. So Angel, um, let's see. So one of your first questions is, can we discuss the use of prednisone as a single agent for dog lymphoma? or part of the multi-agent um, and the differences one might expect? So that's a great question. So, and this kind of ties into Sue's question about her dog with lymphoma. Hey, John, I know you have a lot of questions. So again, we're gonna try to get to them. Some really good questions from John. Thanks for hopping on. So Angel is in Southern California, maybe in the LA or San Diego area. Um, I'm taking a guess, um, but um, so, the best protocol, the best treatment for dogs with lymphoma, what we know at this point, is a CHOP multi-agent chemotherapy protocol. And CHOP is an abbreviation for the main drugs in the protocol. So C is cyclophosphamide, H is doxorubicin, and I know it doesn't begin with an H, but the chemical name does, and I guess that sounded better than SADOP. Uh, so it's uh, doxorubicin. O is the vincristine, which is uh, the trade name is Oncovin, and P is prednisone. And then often we'll use L-SPAR to get them in uh, remission in the beginning. So you'll hear the phrase as a CHOP protocol or CHOP L for the L-SPAR, which is sometimes, again, given in the protocol to get them in remission. So the great thing about that protocol is instead of a one-month survival 
which is, I know, really, really rough for dogs with lymphoma with no treatment. With a CHOP multi-agent chemotherapy protocol, the median survival times increased to about 13 to 14 months. So again, remember, that's the dog in the middle when they looked at all the dogs in the studies that were treated with that. And that means the median, if you go back to our math days, it's not an average, but 50% of the dogs will live longer than that, and 50% of the dogs will live shorter than that. One of my longest term survivors was a dog with a great name, that's why I'm smiling. His name was Jabba the Mutt. And he lived seven and a half years. He did relapse a couple of years after his original CHOP protocol, went back on chemo, <clears throat> um, and successfully completed the second protocol and lived seven and a half years. So if we put him in the average, that could skew it. So again, with a CHOP multi-agent chemotherapy protocol, the median survival time is about 13 to 14 months. And that is considered to be the best protocol. There's a few different CHOP multi-agent protocols out there, a couple of different versions. Most oncologists use the University of Wisconsin-Madison protocol for a couple of reasons. High remission rate, so 80 to 90 percent, some studies up to 95 percent of dogs will go in a complete remission. And we know going into a complete remission is really important. That means your dog's lymph nodes and wherever the lymphoma was at diagnosis, those lymph nodes get small and the cancer goes into remission. So getting into a complete remission has been shown to be good for overall long-term survival for the dog. So the CHOP protocols provide high remission rates and they're very well tolerated. There are some other protocols out there that have um, slightly higher response rates, but again, you'll start to see more toxicity and in some studies, even more deaths related to chemotherapy. So obviously we want to keep that down as well. So the CHOP multi-agent chemotherapy is my uh, treatment of choice for owners that want to do a multi-agent protocol. Um, in comparison to that, if an owner doesn't want to do chemotherapy, um, and sometimes, unfortunately, cost is you know a big factor because chemotherapy can be a lot of visits and very expensive, an alternative option would be steroids. So prednisone is the most common oral steroid that we'll use for lymphoma. And the great thing about that is that it will get the dogs into a part, uh, into a shorter remission. So we see about a 50% remission rate instead of 90 to 95%, and it's much shorter. But the dogs will feel better. So once you absolutely decide against chemotherapy, I would definitely do steroids. I wouldn't not give steroids unless there's a reason that your veterinarian thinks it's not safe for your pet. Um, but again, the dogs will feel better and they will have a shorter, usually complete remission or partial remission. The survival times are pretty dramatic, you know, differently. So you'll see about two to three months instead of that 13 to 14 months as the median survival time. But it is a great option. The other thing, and this is where lymphoma gets really confusing, right, guys, is that there are lots of other protocols out there. There are some single agent protocols. So if you don't want to do a multi-agent protocol and you want to do something more than steroids, you could do a multi-agent, or sorry, a single agent protocol. So you're not going in as often. It keeps costs down. And usually there's even lower side effects. The trade-off, what do you think the trade-off is? Usually lower remission rates, depending on which protocol, somewhere between 60 to 70 to 80 percent, um, and shorter survival times. Again, depending on the protocol and your dog and which type of lymphoma they have, usually around seven to eight to nine months. So again, it's going to vary, but again, it's nice to know that there are some options. But it's overwhelming, and even in this live event, I'm not going to be able to pick the right protocol for your dog. So what do you want to do? You want to talk to your veterinarian or ideally go see an oncologist. Um, I like to share this website, and we'll put it in the comments because I think it's helpful. If you're looking for an oncologist, you want to go to vetspecialist.com, and the great thing about that is you can put in that you're looking for a cancer specialist, you can put in your zip code, and you can find hopefully an oncologist in your area. If you do not find an oncologist in your area, I would recommend that you go into the internal medicine section for small animals because in a lot of, in some geographical areas where there's not an oncologist, there's only about 400 of us in the U.S., internal medicine specialists do have some training in oncology um, and then they can guide you through some of the treatment options as well. So, uh, Angel, hopefully that answers your question, the differences between prednisone and the multi-agent protocol. So, the other question, and I'm glad she asked this because this is one of the most important things, you know, to know about lymphoma. So, steroids, it sounds like if they're going to help, why wouldn't, and your dog has a suspicion of lymphoma or your vet has done an aspirate, why wouldn't you go home on prednisone right away? 
two important reasons. One is we know starting prednisone prior to chemo, multi-agent chemo or any chemo will unfortunately make the cancer cells less responsive to the chemotherapy. So again, you wanna absolutely 190% eliminate the decision that you are going to give chemotherapy before starting your dog on prednisone, because again, it's gonna make the cancer less responsive. The other thing is it will start to kill those cancer cells. That sounds like a good thing, right? No, not actually, because what if you didn't do all of the tests that you need to do before to figure out where the lymphoma is? So like we talked about the ultrasound to see if it's in the liver and spleen. The other really, really important thing is that it will start to kill those cells and make some of your diagnostics possibly non-diagnostic. What do I mean by that? So one of the most important things that we can find out for lymphoma is whether they have the B cell subtype or T. So in general, we say B is better. Those are the dogs that have the higher remission rates and the longer survival times. And so usually that's an add-on specialized test that will require collecting some cells from those lymph nodes again. And so if your dog's already on prednisone, a lot of the times when they come to see me, I can't do this test called flow cytometry to figure out if they have B or T cell. Is that a big a deal? Two reasons it's a big deal. One is we know the B cell dogs tend to do better. And the second reason is we will potentially change their chemotherapy protocol based on B versus T cell. Um, I personally will modify the CHOP protocol for a B cell lymphoma, for a T cell lymphoma and put lomustine in instead of doxorubicin. And if I know a dog uh, owner wants to do single agent chemotherapy, so just give one drug, not come in very fre frequently. If they have B cell, I'm gonna pick doxorubicin. But if they have T cell, I'm gonna pick lomustine. And we have a couple other questions about lomustine um, on my little question uh, screen. So again, that is definitely something um, to think about. You know, So you wanna make sure that you're not gonna give chemotherapy before you start your dog on prednisone. One of the things that I like to tell veterinarians when I'm lecturing, and one of the things that I really think is, to, you know, important as a pet owner to know if you're, you know, if you ever have to deal with this decision from the start, well, what do you do if your dog's not eating while you're waiting for your test results to come back? We can start nausea medications. Serenia is a great vomiting medication, and now there's a relatively brand new drug called Entice. Uh, E-N-T-Y-C-E, uh, and that is a new appetite stimulant, and we can put that link in the, um, in the comment section as well. So you can use nausea medications and appetite stimulants to make your dog start eating while you're waiting for your test results to come back, because prednisone is a great appetite stimulant, but again, it's going to make the cancer less responsive and screw up the diagnostics. So those are things that we don't want to do. So hopefully... Um, that answers that question. I'm gonna keep going. So I just see one question here. Oncologist said that B cell was more deadly than T cell. Um, our doc was Dr. Ward. So um, no, in um, in general, B cells are better and the T cells tend to be um, a little bit more resistant to chemotherapy and in general have shorter survival times. Um, so um, unless there was something special about that case, but in general, we say B is better. With that said, because, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, my dog is T-cell, I shouldn't treat, right? There is no point. And I absolutely disagree um, because I do have T-cell dogs that sometimes do better than my B-cell patients. So nothing is a guarantee, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's very frustrating for an owner with a dog that has B-cell lymphoma when they don't respond as well as they should. So again, um, I still recommend that dogs with T-cell um, can have treatment, but again, I will adjust their chemotherapy drugs for that. So I think that's important information. So hopefully that helps. Okay, um, I'm gonna come back to that other question, Angel. Um, she had a question about hemangiosarcoma. So I'm gonna try to stick with the CHOP chemotherapy uh, theme, and then we'll kind of hit some of the other ones because there was definitely some questions about low mustine. So, uh, Lynn White from Annapolis, Maryland says, Hi, Dr. Sue. My cocker is doing well in the CHOP chemotherapy protocol. 10 months since diagnosis. That's great. All lab work is good except for the liver measures. Can you talk about how the liver plays in detoxing chemo? Uh, her dog is on Denimarin and Ursodiol daily, and her Alkfos, one of the liver values, is currently elevated. 
um, in the 1200s. So um, the liver is a very important organ. Um, I'm just laughing because it has so many functions, but yeah, it definitely metabolizes and breaks down a lot of the chemotherapy drugs. And so that's why we want to make sure that liver values are okay and liver function is okay. Um, one of the, the things that we were just talking about, steroids, prednisone, can cause um, the ALKFOS, which is this one of the liver values, to be elevated, and denimarin, um, which is milk thistle, it's a supplement, milk thistle and SAMe can help with that detoxification um, of the liver, because uh, the prednisone causes free radical damage, so it's an antioxidant, so it can help with that. Um, if your dog is off steroids and off um, chemotherapy and the ALKFOS is still hovering in the 1200, which is pretty elevated, um, you know, other things can cause that. It may be Cushing's, you know, can cause that, which is uh, hyperadrenocorticism. So it may be that you want to talk to your veterinarian or your oncologist or an internist about other causes of elevated liver values. For the dogs that their liver values get elevated when they're on steroids, usually as they taper off their steroids and then the addition of denimarin, their liver values will normalize. Um, a high ALK-FOS doesn't mean that the liver is not functioning well, but it just lets you know that um, this enzyme is being released into the blood and there's a couple of different things that can cause it. So uh, if the ALK-FOS is still elevated and not improving on denimarin, I would talk to your veterinarian about maybe an ultrasound and some additional testing to see what's going on there. Um, but again, there are some drugs that's really important, like if the liver value, something called the bilirubin is elevated, one of the drugs vincristine needs to be lowered actually pretty significantly because that is metabolized and cleared by the liver. And if the liver is not clearing it, it stays around in the dog's blood and in their body longer and they can actually get pretty sick and get those low white blood cell counts. Which reminds me, I forgot to talk about the third side effect. We talked about hair loss and GI side effects. The third uh, side effect, I'm just laughing at myself, is uh, a low white blood cell count. So that is because chemotherapy can damage rapidly dividing cells, which is the hair in certain breeds that we talked about, the GI cells, um, and the white blood cells, the neutrophils, which are their infection fighting cells. So every time your dog goes in for chemotherapy, they should have a white blood cell count checked, which is part of a CBC to make sure that their white blood cell count is okay. And if their white blood cell count is low, they may delay chemo depending on which drug they're getting. And if it's really low, they may actually uh, do some antibiotics. So those are important things to know. All right, Lynn, hopefully that helped with your question there. Um, Mary Ann Bronlow from Springfield, Illinois. How are we doing, guys? Um, I will, I do want to peek over. Hey D, how are you? Um, I'm just going to look over the comments. Just make sure that I'm getting your questions. Uh, Mandy, we are going to talk about the lymphoma vaccine. I promise. Um, what do you recommend for weight gain and prednisone? Uh, that's Kathy's question. It's a good question. So prednisone is a pretty, uh, pretty significant appetite stimulant, which is good for those dogs that have lost some weight. Um, you know, if you're on the CHOP multi-agent chemotherapy protocol or one of the other chemo protocols, we usually taper dogs so we lower their prednisone over three to four weeks and get them off of it. Um, if your dog is only on single agent, uh, just doing prednisone and that's all you're doing, we do keep them on it, but we try to taper it to the lowest dose. If your dog is gaining weight because their appetite is so stimulated by the steroids, um, you can talk to your veterinarian about potentially lowering the dose. Obviously, you don't want the lymphoma to relapse. Um, or tough love and limiting their food or switching to uh, maybe a lower calorie food or watch with the treats and stuff like that. But typically, as you taper them off steroids, the um, that huge appetite drive will uh, improve. Um, all right. So, Brian... Uh, flea and tick medications. Uh, so in general, and I, then I'll get back to some of the questions that were sent in, but this is a good question. I was actually just talking about this with one of my clients. So um, I um, do, especially, you know, it depends on where you live, you know, especially if you're in the South where the flea and, you know, season can be year round, depending on the winter. Um, and, you know, I'm in the Northeast and ticks in, you know, the spring and the summer and the fall are really, really bad here. 
Um, so the last thing I want is my patients to get Lyme disease or anything like that. So I do um, think it's okay to use flea and tick medication. Um, you know, I do think some of the commercial products are the better ones out there. Um, but if you've ever had, has anyone ever had fleas in their house? Ugh, I had it in vet school. It was horrendous. Um, you know, D bugging the house or whatever it's called is pretty miserable. So um, I don't have a specific product that I recommend. I use, um, you know, the commercial products on my dogs. Um, but, you know, again, we don't have any evidence that's going to cause a cancer to relapse or anything like that. And I do think the, you know, I always try to weigh the pros and the cons. And I just think that, you know, especially in certain areas, tick-borne disease is a big deal. And, you know, fleas are definitely not something that you want to bring into your house if you have other pets and for us as well. So, okay. So I'm going to hop back to the question. So Marianne Bronlow, um, thank you for writing in. She has a dog named Buddy who's been in remission for 20 months. Yay. So already a statistics buster, which is one of my favorite hashtags. So we talked about that the median survival is about 13 to 14 months. Most dogs will relapse around 9 to 10 months if you look at across the board with the different multi-agent protocols. So 20 months is great. And she has a great question. So she wants to know when the cancer recurs, how long is the second round of chemo normally effective for? So if the dog has responded for at least the t what I, we consider the standard remission, which is again about 10 months, and that includes their time on chemo. So the CHOP protocol is usually about um, five to six months. And I think that was John's question. So we'll come back to the two different versions of the protocol. Um, but if they finish their chemotherapy protocol successfully, as I graduate, they, they graduate, as I say, and then they relapse sometime after that 10 month part, again, from the, the date of diagnosis, not just being off chemo, we will recommend that they go back on to the CHOP multi-agent chemotherapy protocol. In general, the second remission is half the length of the first, um, and about 50% will go into remission. And that's across the board using different protocols. The reason we recommend the CHOP chemotherapy protocol is a more recent study showed much higher remission rates um, when you go back onto the CHOP uh, chemotherapy protocol. One study showed that almost 100% of the dogs went back into remission, so really high. So again, for Buddy, this dog has gone through the CHOP chemotherapy protocol, is 20 months out since diagnosis. Marianne, I would absolutely, if you can afford it, um, because again, you know, get pet insurance. That's my other little, you know, plea. Get pet insurance while your pets are healthy. Um, we would recommend going back on chemo. And again, statistically, the second remission, if, if Buddy, God forbid, relapsed, relapsed now, would be 10 months. With that said, I see exceptions to the rule all the time. So I have dogs that their first remission is 11 months and their second remission is 16 months. So we will definitely see variations in that. Um, and there will be some dogs that the first remission was 20 months and then it comes back with a vengeance and their second one will only be three or four months. So still worth treating. And again, statistically, if they've done, you know, if they did really well on their first CHOP protocol, meaning they're out at least 10 months or so, I will recommend that they go back on a CHOP chemotherapy protocol. All right. Hopefully, Marianne, that helps. And hopefully, Buddy's remission will remain in long and he can be a, a true statistics buster and a break job of the mutts record because seven and a half years is about my record. If anybody has a great record and wants to drop that in the comments, I would love it. Um, nothing makes me happier than being wrong in the sense that my patients are doing better than the statistics and are being statistics busters. So um, that is always makes me happy. Um, I just saw a great question from Alicia. So she goes, when it gets cold and it has been a cold winter, I'm not sure where you are, Alicia, but it's been super, super cold. Um, is it still okay to walk my dog while they're undergoing chemo? I don't want to compromise his immune system. Yeah, it is totally okay to go for walks. So, you know, the whole point of doing chemotherapy is, you know, I say live longer, live well, and we want our pets not just to be living longer, but living well. So we don't want to put them in a bubble. That doesn't mean that there won't be days going through chemo that maybe they're a little bit more tired or maybe they're a little bit more nauseous and maybe you have to cook or give them their nausea medications like Serenia or give them some Entice. But in general, I want you to look back at your pet's time on chemo and be like, you know what? Absolutely, the good days outweigh the bad days. So in general, 
you know, if they have a, if you go in and they have a super low white blood cell count and your vet sends you home on antibiotics for a couple of days, yeah, I probably wouldn't go to a dog park. I probably wouldn't want my, uh, you know, my lymphoma dog, you know, patient to be hanging out with puppies because they tend to carry, you know, worms and bugs and things like that. But in general, even on a cold day, if you're, you know, if white blood cell count was fine, you know, it's fine to go on walks. And, you know, exercise is good for us and it is good for our dogs. You know, it's all part of that mental health, you know, mental well-being. And we know for people with cancer that that's really important as well. So if you and your dog enjoy going on walks, go for walks. Again, if they have a severely low white blood cell count, that might be, you know, to take a couple of days off while their white blood cell count rebounds. The antibiotics don't lift the white blood cell count or increase them, but it will protect them from getting an infection. But in general, go for walks. It's great. Um, and bundle up because uh, it, it has been cold. All right. Um, doo -doo -doo. There's a question about supplements. I'm going to get to John's question and then we'll, I want to talk about low mustine and then we'll try to wrap up um, with some questions on supplements. So the reason, guys, that I chose this awkward time at 6.30, which is dinner time, and I really appreciate you guys hopping on, I know, um, but is because on Wednesdays, um, one of my sons is at basketball and the other one is at karate. So that became the, my rate limiting step. So um, we have, I'm going to try to keep this about an hour, but I have, I have to pick up my son in about an hour from karate, and I don't want to be that mom that's late because sometimes I am and he doesn't like it. Okay. So, um, John, I, John, you still here? Hopefully you're still here. Um, oh, Alicia, you asked that question about facial paralysis. That's going to be, um, if it's from the lymphoma and the lymphoma is in remission, it, often the paralysis will go away unless the nerve damage has been permanent. But John, I hope you're here. I'm going to scroll on down. Yay. Hey, John, where, let's see, John, I don't know where you're from, but if you want to Put us in the comment section where you are. That would be great. So, John, uh, you had some really great questions. Um, so, Lola um, is his Weimaraner. Uh, two months into the CHOP chemotherapy protocol for B-cell lymphoma. So, as we talked about, that tends to be uh, the better lymphoma. So, again, higher remission rates, longer survival times. Uh, and CHOP chemotherapy would be the protocol that I would pick. Um, and want to know... And this was somebody else's question as well. So what is, do we, the, there's a lymphoma vaccine, which is by Marielle. And he wants to know, do we know about the efficacy? And we don't. And that's really the frustrating part. And that's why a lot of oncologists are not using it routinely in our protocol. So it's immunotherapy. So most of us think as vaccines like rabies vaccine, right? We want to give it to our dogs to prevent them from getting a disease like rabies. There is now immunotherapy such as the melanoma vaccine, which we use in dogs uh, once they're diagnosed with malignant melanoma. And so the same company that developed the melanoma vaccine developed a lymphoma vaccine. It was shown to be safe in the initial studies, but there's not a lot of efficacy data out there. And so I think the idea behind it was if we could show that it's safe and then we can get it out and then, you know, hopefully there'll be some studies maybe by universities or oncologists in practice showing its efficacy. So I have a few colleagues that are using it, but at this point, we don't know whether or not it will increase their survival times and their remissions, which is obviously the goal. So again, I wish we had more information. I was hoping that there would be more studies um, that would be out now by it. But again, we don't have more information about the lymphoma vaccine. I do know that the vaccine is, you're supposed to go through the chemotherapy protocol and then you give four vaccines. It's an intramuscular injection, similar to the malignant melanoma vaccine, two weeks apart for four doses. And then they get a booster, I think every six months. Again, you know, probably safe for your dog to be on it, but again, whether or not, you know, it's going to help, we don't know yet. So stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have more information. So John, you've been doing your homework. Your other question is um, about the monoclonal antibodies that were available. And so those were available from a, a company that I really like and respect called Aritana, um, but they were withdrawn. And so the reason that this was so exciting for us, and I think we first started to get use of them in clinical practice in 2015, is because 
in people, you know, they have significantly increased survival times with rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody, and you combine that with CHOP chemotherapy protocol. You can't use the human monoclonal antibody for dogs, but we've been waiting very impatiently, I would say, for a dog version of it. So what is this monoclonal antibody does? And so when you're giving chemo, you're trying to directly kill those cancer cells with chemo. The way that I like to think about immunotherapy is that the monoclonal antibody is going to identify these lymphoma cells. It almost puts like a little flag on each individual cell. And then that makes those lymphoma cells, which are evading the immune system, noticeable to the immune system. And then the immune system can come in with a couple different mechanisms of action and start to kill those lymphoma cells. So that's the idea behind the monoclonal antibody. And like I said, in people, I think it increased survival times by like another 55%. Like it has just been so important in people with um, diffuse uh, B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there was one for B cell lymphoma and one for T cell, and initial studies looked like they were beneficial, that they were increasing survival times. They were definitely safe, and I did start to use it in some of my patients. Unfortunately, um, both of them have recently, they're not manufacturing them anymore because they haven't seen significant improvements. Uh, so again, really frustrating. I do hope, I'm, I'm not aware if um, Aratana is directly continuing. I hope that they are, um, you know, going to continue to work on this because I think that a monoclonal antibody is going to still be an important breakthrough for us um, in veterinary medicine, but we don't have it. So um, Again, I hope that they are going to have a second or third generation, a new line of them. Um, and as soon as I hear about it, guys, you know that you will hear about it. Um, yeah, I'm hoping it'll be available as well. So, John, I don't think those were probably the answers that you were looking for uh, regarding the lymphoma vaccine and the monoclonal antibody. But I think, you know, they're important to know because they're not inexpensive, uh, requires extra visits to the vet, and we want to make sure that, you know, two things, right? Anytime there's a new hot therapy that's out, you want to know, is it going to be safe for my dog? Um, probably three things. What's the cost going to be? How often do I need to go to the vet to get it? And, you know, what is the efficacy? What is the likelihood that my pet will live longer and be in remission more successfully because of that? And what are the side effects, right? We also don't want the side effects to do, be too bad. That might have been the first one. Anyway, um, John, I hope that helped. Uh, give me a thumbs up or something like that if it did, or a shout out in the comments. Um, and then John had another question, and I alluded to this. Um, John, you still here? I'm gonna take a sip of water. Is anyone still here? I see a couple of you there. Anybody drinking something more fun than I am? Because it is happy hour. So I went with water. I was going to make tea, but I kind of ran out of time as I was getting my sons. Hey, John. Great. I was getting my sons out of the house. So I'm just drinking water and I'm drinking out of a sippy cup, as I say, because I have spilled too many beverages on keyboards and other electronic devices. So I am not allowed <laughs> by my own rules and my husband's rule to have open cups um, by the... Um, by any devices. So a little shout out to Denver. I got this at one of the conferences. All right. So John, you, uh, next question is, uh, you wanted to know if there's a difference between the 19 week version of the CHOP protocol and the 25 week protocol. So the original one is 25 weeks. It is the exact same protocol as the 19 week. So, uh, it's weekly for each cycle and a cycle is four treatments and then there's a week off. And the 19 week protocol is just four cycles, one week apart with a week off after doxorubicin. And that takes 19 weeks to do. Sorry, uh, that's the 19 week. The original version, after the second cycle, you went to every other week. Same drugs, same dosages. It was just more spread out in the beginning. They went to the 19 week protocol because the idea was dose intensity, is giving the chemotherapy in a shorter period of time increases the dose intensity, which has been shown, especially in a lot of human studies, to be correlated with better survivals. Um, that was when I made the shift. Um, and to my knowledge, there is not a study that really compares the 25 to the 19-week protocol. I picked the 19-week protocol mostly because, again, the, there is a lot of science behind the idea of that dose intensity, which is giving the chemotherapy in a shorter time period, um, and I do find that they tolerate it very well. With that said, I do have some dogs that, you know, getting there weekly is a pain in the butt. I'm happy after the halfway mark to go to the every other week protocol. 
or maybe they're getting some low white blood cell counts, um, they're, they're in remission, and rather than lowering the dose, we can continue at the every other week after we get to the halfway one. So um, I haven't seen a difference in side effects, um, in, in response rates, or anything like that. But again, I use the 19-week protocol as my first pick. Um, but then again, if the owner is having problems getting there weekly, after week nine, which is a halfway point, I'll go to every other week. So, um, and again, we'll finish at 25 weeks. So, um, John, which protocol is Lola on? Is she on the 19 or the 25? If you want to put that in the comments. And like I said, I don't think that there's a right or wrong. Um, and you could always talk to your, you know, your cancer specialist or your veterinarian who's ever treating and ask them why they pick that one. But I think either one is a good option. Uh, as long as, you know, again, Lola's in remission and doing well, I wouldn't, um, you know, have any problems with that. All right, so everybody's still doing okay? John, hopefully that answered your questions. Those were great questions, um, and I hope that Lola um, stays in remission. You said she's two months into it, and we hope that she is a statistics buster for sure, and you'll have to keep us updated. Um, and maybe um, on the Doctor's Who page, you can put a picture. I love wine runners. They are very, very cute, uh, usually very high energy, so at least the ones that I have met. Um, okay, so there was a couple of questions about low mustine. So um, this was from Crimson Dressler. She goes, what is a range and how frequently low mustine can be given under doctor supervision? Of course, thank you for that. Um, my lab, Golden Rufus, uh, he's 110 pounds. <laughs> that is a big dog. In November, he's on 110 milligrams once every 21 days along with daily prednisone. His lymph nodes shrink to nothing the first three days after lomustine and then spend the next two and a half weeks swelling up again. Uh, we've not had a remission, just that two to three interval where their nodes are normal. So he was diagnosed in the second week in December, just turned five the week before. Mm, it always sucks around the holidays, right? Um, let's see if I didn't scroll down. Ah! Sorry. Hey, Christine. <laughs> um, sorry. For some reason, I missed all these questions because I didn't scroll down. I'm not the most technical. Don't tell people. Um, what is your personal experience? So just looking at the questions from John. Uh, he's still here. Bruce is drinking Diet Coke. <laughs> we have some chai tea. Um, next time we're doing wine. I'm in cold northern New York. Yep. Um, okay. We keep you updated. They are extremely high energy and very lovable. They are. So sorry about that, guys. I forgot that I needed to scroll down. So I'm, I'll get better the more we do this. Um, okay, so um, the question from Crimson is, um, so her dog was just diagnosed mid-December, got his first dose of, so he was on Pred first and then went on to low mustine. So not to be Debbie Downer, but we talked about this in the beginning of the of the session, right? So being on prednisone, unfortunately, has been shown to make make the chemotherapy less effective. So I'd be concerned because one of the other things I mentioned is getting a dog in remission and having a two or three day response to chemotherapy and then the next three weeks with the interval with a lymph node swell up again, that's not a remission. Remission is something that is durable. So usually two to three weeks at least would be. So that waxing and waning is not great. Um, we want our pets to get into a complete remission and hold that remission. And we do know that dogs that go into a complete remission um, end up living longer and having those longer survival times, which is what we want. Um, so again, I would be concerned that the being on prednisone may have something to do with that. Um, in general, lomustine is given every three weeks. Um, we don't want to give it sooner than that um, because it can have additional side effects, and we'll go through those in a sec. I just want to make sure I answer the question. Uh, they moved up the dose in 24 hours. He's markedly better. Yeah, so one of the reasons in general we don't give lomustine more frequently is, so we talked about the side effects. Remember in the beginning we talked about hair loss? Not a big deal. GI side effects, usually mild to moderate, and we can help prevent them and shorten them with the appropriate medications and that low white blood cell count. So usually that's the neutrophils. 
Lamustine has two special side effects that it can cause. One is it can cause low platelets. Um, usually we see the plate, low platelets with multiple doses. So it's what we say it's cumulative. So usually you'll start to see it after the couple of doses. I've had some dogs where I've given 10 doses of Lomustine at every three weeks apart and they don't have any platelet issues, but I've seen some dogs after the third, fourth, you know, they can have it. And if the platelets are low, we need to give them time to rebound. And I have had some dogs on low mustine that their platelets never recovered and they got so low that we were worried about bleeding issues and bleeding out or bleeding internally, nosebleeds and things like that. So it's definitely something that your veterinarian, your oncologist is going to be watching for if your pet's on low mustine. Not only is the neutrophils, the white blood cell count okay, but the platelets. So that's one of the reasons that we don't give it more frequently than every three weeks. There are sometimes you can add other drugs more safely in that three week interval. So Crimson, you may wanna to talk to your oncologist slash veterinarian about vincristine or adding another drug. I'll do that for some of the patients where it doesn't look like low mustine alone is enough. Um, the other side effect from low mustine is liver toxicity. And that's something that if your dog is getting low mustine, so we talked about if you're getting regular other, not regular, but some of the other chemo drugs, you're always gonna get that complete blood count the day of chemo or within 24 hours, right? Because you wanna check the white blood cell count and make sure that the white blood cell count is okay. Um, if your pet is getting low mustine, we also need to check one of the liver values called the ALT. And usually if it's more than two times the high end of normal, so usually around 250. Most labs about 120, 125 is normal. I'm probably not gonna feel really comfortable giving lomustine. Um, I will delay treatment and potentially give something that's a little bit more liver friendly. Why? Because lomustine can cause liver failure. And in one of the original studies, it was, um, it, it, the dogs didn't recover from it. I've had one dog in my career uh, go into liver failure from it, and with a couple of days of hospitalization, his liver did forgive us, and um, you know he did recover. We never gave him a mustine again. We switched his protocol. Um, but again, um, you want to be really careful. So those are some of the reasons why you wouldn't want to give low mustine more frequently than every three weeks. So Crimson for Rufus, um, I would want you know since he's not really getting in remission, I would talk to your oncologist, your veterinarian about, ideally I'd switch drugs, I'd switch protocols, um, or try to add something else like vincristine or one of the other drugs that we use. Um, <laughs> so Mandy, um, she is saying that her dog's appetite has increased since being on chemo in October and has gained 15 pounds. We're an Italian family that generally shows love with food. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Jewish family as well, and I always say Jews and Italians are similar, so lots of talking with hands and lots of love with food. So um, it's the reason I'm laughing, it is not uncommon for dogs um, to gain weight on chemo, and I think a lot of it is we're so concerned that they're going to lose weight, and most dogs, you know, their appetite doesn't suffer too bad from chemotherapy, and we overfeed them because owners think they have to fatten them up. One of my uh, early patients that I treated was Lola. She was a black Labrador. Um, she was on steroids for about two weeks because her family was away and an emergency doctor had put her on. Um, when she came home, her, uh, her veterinarian in my area, her general practitioner referred her to me and she even wrote in the record, I didn't start the prednisone, I know better. And I told Lola's owners, you know, in general, this is gonna make the chemo less effective. You know what, her first remission was four and a half years. So again, remember, remember, Dr. Sue loves to be wrong in those scenarios. So that was a great example where being on steroids did not hinder her response. But the other point with Lola is after she finished chemotherapy and she came in for, I hadn't seen her for a while, mom stopped coming in for rechecks. Um, she had four kids. Um, if Stacy is on, Stacy Conlon will definitely, she was my chemo nurse back in the day. She now works for Dr. Stevenson up in Watertown. But Kyle, ask her about Lola. Um, she gained 25 pounds. She also developed soft tissue sarcoma before her cancer relapsed uh, four and a half years later. So again, it's not uncommon for our dogs. So we don't want them to gain weight because you know a lot of our pets can do well. And we do know there's a great study in, in, in Labradors again, where Labradors that were leaner, uh, they um, 
they live two years longer. And think about that, like two years in a dog's life is a really long time. So, you know, again, exercise, healthy eating, adding, you know, fruits and vegetables, the safe ones for dogs to their diet are all really good things. And we're going to finish up with some of the supplements as well. So um, Crimson, hopefully that answers your question. How's everybody doing? I'm going to remember to scroll down. Um, yeah, Piper gained a lot of weight, Judy is saying. Um, let's see, David, if you started CHOP with flow cytometry, does this mean you would only use low mustine if CHOP doesn't work? So um, David, I'll say that without mumbling. <laughs> if I started CHOP chemotherapy based on flow cytometry, does this mean I would only use low mustine if the CHOP doesn't work? So if I had a B cell, which is the 60 to 80% of dogs have B cell lymphoma, which is the better one. If they have B cell, I would continue with the CHOP chemotherapy protocol. If they have the T cell, T is in Tom, I personally, and there's not a study, I'm going to be very honest with you, there's not a study that shows that this is better, but there is a study that shows that the T cell dogs don't do as well in the CHOP protocol. I pull out the doxorubicin, which we know they don't do, they don't, the T cells don't as respond. We know that they respond preferentially to low mustine. So I put the low mustine in the protocol. So every week where there's a doxorubicin, I put in the low mustine. Um, I'd love to be able to do a study and show that. Um, and then if an owner, if we know their dog has T-cell lymphoma and they want to do single agent chemo and not the CHOP chemo, I would do single agent low mustine. If they have B-cell, I would do single agent doxorubicin, both of those at every three weeks. Um, doxo can go up to every two weeks, but low mustine, I would not give every um, two weeks. I would stick with the three week interval. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, yeah, so Shelly, um, and I'm not sure if um, you had actually asked this before, but I got another question. What do we do to keep the dogs in remission? And that is a great question. I'm just going to see. Um, no, so the, uh, Patricia also, uh, Frankenwood? I'm horrible with last names. Um, Patricia also asked the same question, Shelly. So the question is, what do you do to keep a dog in um, in remission, how do we do that? So there's, it's very hard. So I think one thing, and let's just kind of step back is enjoy the time with our dogs, right? You know, I think a lot of the times once they graduate with chemotherapy, um, we do worry about, um, when is the cancer going to come back? And you can really just lose sight of why we treated our pets with, um, chemo and why we treat their cancer. So they can have a great quality of life and that we can, um, you know, we can enjoy their time and their time with us as their family. So remember to stop and enjoy each day with our pets because it truly is a gift. But to answer the question, what can we do to keep them in remission? So one thing I think that is important is at least in my opinion, monthly appointments with your veterinarian, with your oncologist to feel their lymph nodes, aspirate the lymph nodes. There's a lymphoma blood test that we can use for uh, monitoring, which can detect um, relapse earlier than the lymph node aspirates when you stick a needle in their lymph nodes. Um, and that is by Avacta. Um, and hopefully we can put a link in that so you can tell your veterinarian about it. It's not a, a super popular test, but it, it should be in my opinion. So again, one of the things I think you should do is monitor because when they relapse, just like early diagnosis in the beginning, we want to find that early so we can get them back on treatment as soon as possible. Um, other things I do like are supplements. And so again, there's not as much science behind the supplements, whether or not they will prevent the cancer from coming back. But I have a couple of ones that I like, um, and I will actually start my patients on during their chemotherapy. If you guys have been on any of my um, ones before, I definitely recommend Apicaps, and we can drop that in the supplement. You do not want to use Apicaps at full dose if your dog is on a non-steroidal like Rimadyl Deramax. And you do not want to use Apicaps at full dose if your dog is on prednisone. So I usually wait until my uh, patients are off prednisone, they're tapered off the prednisone, and then I will add Apicaps. Is a plant-derived supplement, has um, curcumin from the um, turmeric spice, apigenin, luteolin, milk thistle, some gingerols. So it's a multi-plant supplement that will help promote, we hope, uh, cell death of the cancer cells. So I like Apicaps. Um, I like fish oils. Uh, there's lots of benefit of fish oils, healthy heart, healthy skin, joints. Um, my Matilda, who's getting her TPL surgeries on fish oils. Um, but there's also anti-inflammatory properties, and we think that that helps ties into an anti-cancer effect. 
Um, I know that somewhere in the question, someone asked how much fish oils, um, and I don't want to misquote, but I think it's 700 milligrams total of the, um, the DHA and the other one, which is escaping me at the moment. Um, but don't quote me on that, and we will put it in the comment section um, by tomorrow because I want to look up that dose. So fish oils, apicaps, and then the other thing that I personally like are the um, mushroom polysaccharides. So there's two main ones on the market. For most of my patients, I like Canine Immunity Plus. Um, it is um, an immune booster. It helps uh, hopefully modulate the immune system. So we know one of the problems with cancer patients is their immune system is not recognizing these cancer cells as foreign. So I like Canine Immunity Plus. There's also I Immunity, which uh, for another uh, podcast we'll talk about is the one that um, they use uh, in the hemangiosarcoma study at Penn. It's significantly more expensive. So again, I think during the lymphoma treatment, I like the Canine Immunity Plus and you can get that on Amazon. So uh, if you're all Amazon Prime, and if you're not, I don't know why you wouldn't be, um, you know, I would definitely recommend that. So, um, so yes, we will hopefully link the supplements. Uh, but again, Apicaps, Canine Immunity Plus, and a fish oil. I use Nordic Naturals. There's a lot of great fish product or fish products, a lot of great um, products out there. Um, you know, also, I co-wrote a book a couple of years ago with Damian Dressler, Dog Cancer Survival Guide. There's a lot more supplements in there. And I think if you're really interested in supplements, it's very um, helpful to contact an integrative or holistic veterinarian, um, and they can help you with that. Uh, turkey tail mushrooms, another option as well. Uh, yes, there are people helping me remember um, the different fish oils. So um, fish oil or salmon oil. I'm going to put all those comments in, um, you know, there's krill oil as well, but I'm going to put all that in the comments later as well. So you have 700 milligram fish oil in all sizes, and you can divide that. The main side effect with fish oils can be diarrhea. So again, I don't start all the supplements at once, even, um, you know, even if you're just doing steroids, because again, I think that it, you know, then you don't know what's causing the side effects. So I usually personally, when they start their chemo treatment, I do nothing except for the chemo the first week and steroids. Then I personally add the canine immunity. Then if they're not having a GI side effects, I'll add the fish oils in the next couple of weeks. And then I will add apicaps once they're off their steroids. I'll add that in at a slightly lower dose and then bump them up once they're done. Uh, Kathy loves the book and thank you very much. I appreciate the feedback. Hey, Laura. So Laura works at my practice, the Veterinary Cancer Center uh, in Norwalk, Connecticut. So if you guys are looking for me, that's where I am now. I changed practices a couple of years ago couple of years ago, a couple of months ago. Laura, are you sick of me yet? Um, so let me just see. Um, hopefully I answered most of the questions. It was kind of hard to, to get through everything. Um, so Christine King, who is uh, my fellow uh, high school, we went to school for years and I did see her dog. So she asked about supplements, more exercise. Yes. Uh, should you be using Denimarin? Um, I Denimarin is that liver supplement. If you're on low mustine, to go back to that, I do recommend keeping them on Denimarin. There was a study that showed that they're more likely to stay on Denimarin longer and have less liver uh, side effects. Another study disproved that, but again, if I have a patient that is on low mustine, I will keep them on Denimarin. Um, if their liver values are normal and they're not on low mustine in their protocol, I don't think Denimarin is one of the supplements that they need to be on. Exercise is great, you know. Again, there may be some days when your pet's a little bit more tired, and if your dog's tired, you know, give them that day off. But again, I think, you know, exercise is good for the body. It releases endorphins. We know that in people, um, and I don't know, you know, why we wouldn't want to do that. And there are some actually cool studies looking at exercise um, in pets as well and the benefits of that in terms of when they're going through treatment. So I think that that would be great. So Albie um, is um, Christine's beautiful white pity that she rescued that I had the honor of helping start his treatment. And Christine, I saw somewhere in the comments you asked about the MOP protocol. So the MOP protocol is another good rescue protocol. Um, so I usually personally don't use it as a frontline therapy. Um, I will use it when they relapse. So um, if they relapse in the middle of the CHOP protocol, that's usually my next favorite protocol. The hard part about the MOP protocol is the mustard drug. The M1 is pretty expensive. 
Um, so it can be a little bit cost prohibitive, but that's one of my favorite multi-agent protocols for if they don't respond to the original protocol um, or if they relapse. And that is a good protocol that I like as well. And it's surprising how well tolerated it is considering it's another multi-agent protocol. They get the mustogen and the vincristine or vinblastine, one of these, one of those two drugs with the mustogen on the same day. And they actually do pretty well. And then they go home on oral chemo for two weeks. So that is, um, I like milk, milk thistle as well. Uh, Judy, thank you for coming to the broadcast. Um, how much milk thistle? I do not know, Patricia, the milk thistle amount offhand. Um, if you're using Denimarin, milk thistle is in it. So Denisil was the, the earlier version of that, which is just the SAMI, um, but milk thistle is in that, and I usually use that. I don't supplement it. Um, so that would be something that maybe your veterinarian could look up for you or a holistic vet would know. But again, um, I usually use the amount of milk, milk thistle. There is also some milk, milk thistle in the apicaps as well, and I don't have any problems if I'm using Denimarin with apicaps. I do that all the time. Um, Let's see, we have a few more minutes before we have to get Hudson. Um, I use canine immunity. What do you suggest with her eyes? Um, facial paralysis, I'm not going to be able, Alicia, to really make specific recommendations regarding your dog. You want to talk to your veterinarian about that. But, you know, if they can't blink well, they need to be on, you know, some sort of lube and things like that. Because if they're not able to blink and get their tears, they're definitely at risk for um, eye ulcers, corneal ulcers, which are super painful and things like that. So those would be the things that I would worry about is some sort of lube um, just to make, you know, some sort of ointment lube that will keep the... Um, keep the cornea nice and moist. Just scrolling through, um, we talked about that, Angel. Angel had another interesting question. So she's the oncology nurse in Southern California, if I remember correctly. Um, um, surgery. So no, sorry, just trying to read. I can't read and talk at the same time, clearly. So she wanted to, um, uh, had a question about hemangiosarcoma and lymphoma. And are, as these are both blood cancers, is one the process or the other? So they're comp they're very different cancers, even though they do involve the blood. But um, hemangiosarcoma is a malignant cancer of the blood vessel itself, and lymphoma is a cancer of one of the blood cells. So the lymphocyte, which is part of our immune system, um, hemangiosarcoma is of those blood vessels. So sort of the tubes that our blood runs through. Um, I have had dogs. So one of my uh, favorite German shepherds that I ever treated, and if Stacy is on, she will remember Gunner as well. So Gunner um, was a lymphoma patient of ours, and I kid you not, he was. I think he was out like like 18 or 19 months and on April Fools on April 1st he had a, a hemo abdomen and they went in and did surgery and he had a mangiosarcoma and mom you know the survival time for that with surgery is about one to three months and with chemo about six to nine months and uh, we added some more chemo and then some oral chemo and mom's goal was to get him out a year uh, which I told her was not likely but we would do our best so his lymphoma stayed in remission with the additional chemo and um, he, he ended up being euthanized on April 2nd the following year so a year and a day so again another statistics buster but they are different cancers um, hopefully that makes sense and at some point um, we are going to do some other topics as well and mangiosarcoma is a common one so we, I'm sure that will be one of the ones that we start to do um, in the next couple of months so um, in general we don't do surgery for lymphoma um, and I know that's really different than most of the cancers. So if your dog has mammary breast cancer, we're going to do surgery first. If they have a, a soft tissue sarcoma or one of those skin cancers, you're going to aspirate it first, right? Why wait, aspirate. Um, you want to be very proactive with lumps and bumps. But those tumors we tend to cut out, osteosarcoma, bone cancer, we do surgery first before chemo. But this is a cancer of the lymphatics, of those lymphocytes. And those cells are circulating throughout the body. They're pooling in the different organs like the liver and spleen and things like that. So um, in general, we don't do surgery for lymphoma because they need chemo anyway. As we'll talk at the next one in cats, sometimes if they have a GI obstruction, so if they have small intestinal lymphoma and it's obstructing, we may do chemo. Um, but in general, um, sorry, we may do surgery, but in general, chemo is a treatment of choice because this is, and you'll hear us say it's a systemic cancer. What do we mean that? 
it's in the system, it's throughout the system, so you can't cut it out with just surgery. Um, you know, same thing with radiation. So radiation tends to be a focal treatment. Um, I have had some dogs that have had really big lymph nodes that were like coalescing around their neck and the dog was having difficulty breathing and they're breathing with their neck out. That might be one that will give a couple of doses of radiation to shrink those if chemo is not working. But in general, chemo is going to be your treatment of choice for lymphoma. Um, so guys, we are hitting the hour mark and I know this has been a very long session and hopefully you guys will have, the, it, this was useful. Debbie, can a dog have mast cell and lymphoma? Yeah. So I see, I call these, you know, these dogs overachievers, but I have dogs, um, <laughs> I don't know why, but maybe it's because I, you know, feel for lumps and bumps, but I've had a good number of dogs develop mast cell tumors that we find, maybe it's because they're coming to the vet all the time, but you know, during their, um, their lymphoma treatment and, um, Bruno, one of my other favorite patients that had multiple mast cell tumors, um, also at osteosarcoma over the years, lived over two years with that. So statistics buster also had soft tissue sarcomas and also had a benign splenic mass that required his spleen to come out because it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So yes, you can have more than one cancer for sure. Um, Helena, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, mammary cancer is definitely one of the ones that I want to go. So, um, before we don't leave, don't leave me. No, uh, before we go, I just want to make sure that I hit all of the, um, big questions here. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Was this helpful? If it was, please put a thumbs up or, um, something in the comments. Um, I hope that you guys are enjoying this. Um, you know, it's really hard to find a cancer specialist. Yay. Thank you for being here. Um, I mean, it's not hard to find one, but it may be hard in your area. It's scary. One thing I want to say before we go is don't feel that you're going to have to treat. I have a lot of people that come see me, you know, that just want information and we want, I, I'm always happy when they go home and think about it before they decide. With lymphoma, that's one of the ones that I think it's good to be prepared to treat that day because it is such a rapidly progressive cancer, but most of the other cancers answers. I say, go home, think about it. It actually makes me feel a little bit better when the clients come back a day or two later and say, yep, I want to do the CT scan. Yep. I want to start treatment because I know that they've had the time to weigh the pros and cons and make the best educated decision. The other thing with chemo guys, just remember that it is not a contract. You do, you're not obligated to continue chemo. You can stop treatment. So, you know, you see how your pet does. Most pets do really, really well and the owners will keep coming back. And you know, one of the reasons, check out my video section on YouTube, um, subscribe to my channel please, and on Facebook as well. One of the reasons I do these videos is I want to see you to see that the pets are not being tortured during chemo. They're there, they're getting love, they're wagging their tails, um, and we try to make it as pleasant, a pos you know, pleasant as possible for them during treatment. And most owners are so surprised that they're, they're getting chemo. And I, if I had a dime for every time someone said they have more energy than they did. And that's the reason that I feel so comfortable saying consider chemo because the owners are so pleased with how their pets are doing. So I hope that you guys, if you're going through chemo, that you're pleased with how your dog is doing. If not, talk to your veterinarian, talk to your oncologist. Maybe you can be more proactive with nausea medication. Get enticed. You should have a goodie bag of Serenia, metronidazole, a probiotic, and if they're not eating well, you know, have some entice or metazapine on hand. So if they puke or they're not eating at nine o'clock at night, you can jump on it and get those medications on board. So I really, really hope that that was helpful. If I missed your question, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll try to get it next time. Um, does anyone remember the date that I said the cap? Oh, day after Valentine's Day. So day after Matilda's surgery, February 15th, we're going to go back to our normal 9 p.m. time. We're going to do cat lymphoma. And then March, I don't know the date, but in March, uh, let's see, March, um, March 13th will be our next one. And that will be a topic TBA. So to be decided to be announced. So um, I was thinking maybe splenic tumors or bone tumors or mammary tumors, um, but maybe we'll do a poll and you guys can let us know what you want to know. Um, and please share this, tag your friends. Um, you know, we want as many people to have as much information as possible. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, thank you. Oh, Shelly, happy. Well, 
Do you want to spend your birthday with me? Um, hopefully, I mean, I want you to come to the cat one, but if you don't need to know about the cat one, you know, um, but a good, it, you know, information is power. So guys, I am so thankful that you chose to spend your dinner hour with me. Um, in California, it's a little bit earlier and on the West Coast, I'm really, really appreciative. I hope that this was helpful. If I missed your question, I apologize, but hopefully the other information will be useful. I'm just scrolling through and I think, you know, I think we hit most of the most of the questions. So um, if not, we'll hopefully add some other information in the links and have a great week. It's Wednesday. So happy hump day, everybody. And um, we'll see you at the next live Q&A, I hope. And uh, stay tuned on the channel. And guys, if I could ask one more question, if you could please subscribe to my YouTube channel and tell your friends about it. That is a great way. Um, we will post these videos there uh, and catalogs so they're much easier to find in my humble opinion than on Facebook where it just goes down the feed and they're hard to find. And there's lots of videos of pets getting chemo, what does an aspirate look like, and then vlogs so you can see what it's like behind the scenes at the practice. And, um, you know, we love what we do. And my team, uh, you know, Suzanne, my nurse uh, is here. Uh, Laura, you know, it takes a village. I'm so blessed to work with so many great people. So thanks for coming, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, can we put a link? Uh, Patricia, do you want a link for YouTube? Hopefully we can definitely put a link there um, and hopefully right to the subscribe channel. Um, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And we will see you um, in a couple of weeks for the next one. Thanks, everyone.